please let everyone uh, accept that you'll be participating in the recording. Uh, so the first um, to um, let you know that this program is entitled, whoops, excuse me, uh, Practical Approaches to Physical Activity and Participation Interventions or Experiences for Children with Disabilities and Their Family. We're so excited. We've been working on this um, presentation, this webinar for quite some time, my colleagues and I. Um, the objectives of the program um, are to describe conceptual models to our frame and activity-based interventions to promote physical activity and participation in children at risk for or with disabilities to discuss clinical decision-making strategies and designing and measuring effective activity-based interventions, um, to identify active ingredients in the active-based interventions, and describe collaborative and inclusive family-based interventions to promote the physical activity and participation. We have four very talented um, speakers today, and I'd like to just give you a brief background about our speakers. The first speaker will be Dr. Anu Kununen, and she's a principal lecturer in social and healthcare education at Lapland University of Applied Sciences. She's a physiotherapist and a special educator. She's worked in the public health sector as a physiotherapist. Her main areas of teaching are in pediatric physical ther physiotherapy, interprofessional collaboration, and her research focuses on collaboration between parents, teachers, and therapists to support the participation of children with disabilities. Um, her research is uh, key to um, building a roadmap for children with disabilities towards a rich and happy in adulthood and focusing on collaborative efforts and rehabilitation. She is a member of, our, of the IOPTP Research Committee um, and has served um, for quite some time on that committee. The second speaker will be Dr. Maggie O'Neill. Um, Dr. O'Neill is a pediatric physical therapist and research uh, rehabilitation researcher. She is a full time, uh, she works full time in an academic position, but was a full time clinical pediatric physical therapist for almost 12 years before earning her master's degree in public health and maternal child health and her PhD in pediatric rehabilitation sciences. Her research focuses on identifying objective measures of physical activity in ambulatory youth with cerebral palsy to inform active and effectiveness of activity-based interventions in fitness, activity, and participation outcomes. Dr. O'Neill collaborates with exercise scientists to examine objective activity measures. She collaborates with computer and biomedical engineers to design customized video Uh, and games and virtual augmented reality experiences for youth and children with cerebral palsy. She's an active member of the American Physical Therapy Association, the World Physiotherapy Association, and the Academy for Cerebral Palsy and Developmental Medicine. And our third speaker, Dr. Manon Blauen, is a pediatric physical therapist and clinical health scientist. She has extensive work experience in pediatric rehabilitation field. She finished her PhD in 2017 um, in the area of physical fitness testing and wheelchair use with children with uh, spina bifida and physical activity in children with physical disabilities. She currently works as a senior researcher in the research group Lifestyle and Health at the Research Center in Sustainable Living at Folk School Utrecht um, University of Applied Sciences. Uh, with a research program in child motion, she focuses on participatory research in children with disabilities, inclusion and participation in physical activities, including physical fitness and behavioral change. In addition, she's chair of the Pediatric Expertise Group at HU, and is a lecturer at the Master of Physical Therapy program, a specialization uh, with physical pediatric physical therapy at the Institute of Human Movement Studies, is a board member of the Dutch Association of Pediatric Physical Therapists, and a member of the World Physio 
International Organization of Pediatric Physical Therapy and Research Committee. She loves to connect with uh, trials of research and clinical practice and education in the field of physical physiotherapy. And again, my name is Dale Scalise Smith. And I currently serve as the Vice President of Allied Health and Academic Services at Orbis Education, a leader in online education in the healthcare industry. I've served in numerous academic uh, leadership roles, and I'm currently a Dean and Professor Emeritus from Utica University. Um, I have a master's degree in physiotherapy and a PhD in special education from the University of North Carolina as well as a doctorate from Utica University. I practice in the pediatric um, community settings and have served since 2007 as the program chair for the International Organization of Physiotherapists and Pediatrics and previously served on the World Physiotherapy 2021 Congress Committee. So what you have here is just a great opportunity to hear from colleagues We'll spend about uh, 70 minutes in the presentation, and then um, we'll offer the time for people to enter um, questions in the chat room. So thanks very much, and I'd like Anu to um, begin. Okay, thank you, Dale, for nice presentation. I hope you all can hear me, and greetings from rainy Finland. And I'm so happy to see so many people participating with us in this webinar. We are very excited as group presenting, presenting to you our thoughts and experiences. And I will walk you through our first objective. Dale nicely presented you our four objectives. And, and the first one was describing conceptual models to frame activity-based interventions to promoting physical activity and participation. I will short you, introduce you, as all you know, the ICF, of course, the framework launched by WHO. Of course, we will shortly look at F words and then look some interventional intervention models enhancing physical activity and participation. And along the way, I will give you some practical examples from Finland. So let's begin the grounding work of ICF. I think we all recognize the ICF framework, International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health, a guiding framework in our rehabilitation interventions. And this has been from 2000, year 2001. So we have made a lot of efforts to use this in our interventions, in our rehabilitation assessment work. But in 2012, as we all perhaps know, the Dr. Rosenbaum and Dr. Görter published an article titled F words in childhood disability. I swear this is how we should think. And I think that was quite a kind of a game changer in the way we approach to our rehabilitation interventions and designing the interventions. So these F words should be the guiding principles how we look at our all children's development and rehabilitation, focusing on what they can do, of course, but not focusing what they can't do. And this F words framework was built based on the ICF, as you can see it here. And of course, it is based on a lot of research work behind it. So I think this was the way to look at the rehabilitation interventions through children's and their families' eyes. Truly, they gave us a practical tools to help us find the ways to make the interventions more, uh, more child-oriented and more family-focused. So function was the first F, first F word, refers what people do, how things are done is not important for us. Family represents the essential environments for all children. Fitness, all our children should stay physically active. And what is fun, what they enjoy, what they are fun about, what they like to do. Of course, the friendship zone, 
So it refers to friendships established with peers because the social development is an essential aspect of personhood. And of course, it's all it's about future. Our children will grow up one day. So we need to focus on what the children and what are the parents' expectations and dreams for the future. So I know this, these are the tools we many of you know, and you perhaps you use in your practical interventions. But just to remind you that Kanchad has a very good F words hub where you can find these practical tools to use it in your in your practices. You can find tools, uh, for example, words agreement or F words collage or the F words profile. So advise you to go there if the, if that is not familiar to you. But but there are very practical tools to use it and to have really assure that our child's are heard and we are seeing that what they can do, but they not focusing what they can't do. So these are the guiding principles in our pediatric rehabilitation, as we all know. But then I wanna share you one example from Finland based on the ICF framework and based on the F words. It's a case example from rehabilitation planning setting. Uh, I don't have now time to walk you through the Finnish rehabilitation system, but this rehabilitation planning was made in a university hospital. And in the middle of this process, of course, is the child. It was a five-year-old boy with a hemiplegia. And on the right side of this picture, on the right side of the boy, you can see the universal hospital professionals. There were a doctor, occupational therapist, and then physiotherapist and the pediatric nurse. And on the left side of this child, of the boy, you can see the adults participating in the daily life. Of course, they are the key actors. Parents are, of course, in the, uh, involved in this rehabilitation planning. And then there is a kindergarten teacher because the boy was going daily in the kindergarten. And then there was a physiotherapist. And in the rehabilitation process, of course, based on the ICF framework and the F words, in assessment, in documentation process and rehabilitation, nego rehabilitation negotiation, they used this ICF framework and F words to find out what was meaningful for the child and, of course, for the parents and the family. But interesting question was how to involve the child in rehabilitation planning, how they could make the rehabilitation plan more alive to the child and how he could more involve himself in the process and then to the, of course, the training sessions be after it. So here are a few background information for you before I, I show you the rehabilitation plan. But like I told you, it was a five-year-old boy with a hemiplegia. His family considered mother and father. And important people in his, in his life were also his physiotherapist, which he saw once or twice in a week. And of course, daily, he saw the kindergarten teacher. He also had friends in kindergarten and, and in his neighborhood. He, he thought that he was in a quite good shape. But he, that, uh, but he thought that he needed reminding of using his both hands in, in action in daily activities. He thought that he can manage almost all the time by himself, but he had little bit difficulties keeping up with the peers when, when there was a running, for example, in the kindergarten. And then he told that he loved fishing and playing with little cars. He also enjoyed riding a bike and he truly loved going rallies with his father. That was a very meaningful thing for him. And he, when he thought about the future, he, had, he was a little bit worried about going to preschool because next year he was going to preschool. He was a little bit excited, but also worried. How could he manage there? So they thought that how could they, the professionals in his life, in the hospital professionals, and of course the prof or adults in the daily life, they thought that how could they involve the child in the rehabilitation process and after 
the negotiation. So, so how was this? Was how they put it. They put it in the picture. And as you can see in this picture, as I told you, you can see the daily environment of the child. You can see the home and you can see the kindergarten on the top of the picture. You can see the rally racing environment in, in Finnish. I'm so sorry, these few words are in Finnish, but it is called Jokkiskisat. It, so it's the rally environment. You can see the meaningful activities for the boy in this picture. You can see the fishing and riding a bike. Then, of course, you can see the kindergarten because there were the uh, activities that he was doing with his peers. And, of course, you can see on the right side of this picture, the future perspective, there is down low, you can see the preschool where he is driving. And as you know, I told you that he loved cars. So in the middle of this rehabilitation plan is, is the boy riding the red car. And with him in the car is sitting the important adults in his daily life, mother and the father and the other important adults and friends that he has. And edgy, on the edges of this picture, you can see his own goals what he wanted to achieve in the next year or in the next months. He wanted to run faster. He wanted to find where he's going. He wanted to use, to use his both hands in actions. He wants to find his stuff. So it's like putting the rehabilitation plan in, in child's language. For one picture he could put on the wall or you can, the adults, and the child can see where they are going together, what they have agreed to do. So the child's functional networks is in this picture and the rehabilitation plan designed in one painting. I think that was a very good example of how we can put the mo our rehabilitation plan live and in children's language. So what they learned about this project was that the child and the family felt that they had an active role in the rehabilitation process. They were the key actors to guide, to lead it. The child's meaningful things were recognized and all actors were involved to work toward jointly agreed goals. And their collaboration came more effective and multifunctional collaboration came more reality. So like one therapist said that it was shocking that the adults around the child were not aware of all the child's strengths and difficulties, how much we adults assume things and how little we ask from the child directly. So even though this process was quite uh, time consuming, it took more time, but they thought that it was still worthy because the child's daily life and the meaningful, uh, meaningful things came more alive and real to reality for all the adults that were working with the child in his daily activities. So I think that was a nice example about how the how you can use the F words to lead us and how the child's voice can be more heard also in our rehabilitation planning. Of course, we need the our documentation as we do it, but but we have to think about the ways to, to involve the children in our rehabilitation. So moving on to from planning to interventions, we want to present you Sarah Reedman's excellent work on Participate CP based on her research. I think this is a very practical model to use it in our rehabilitation intervention. It's a participation focused therapy for physical activity participation in children with CP. And the key elements of this model is that it is family-centered, it's ecological, done in participants' home and community setting, it's goal-directed, so the treatment choice is driven by the participation goals. It's collaborative, the goals set it together between the therapist and the family. It's context-focused, it's individualized, it's behavior-oriented, 
the participation in leisure time physical activity will be recognized as a health behavior. Looking at the wider perspective of, of physical activity. And of course, it is self-determined. Self so this is a one practical model to use when you design your pediatric rehabilitation interventions. But as, how, as we have learned now, what are the key elements enhancing the physical activity and participation? We have discovered that uh, we have learned that it's truly a discovery journey to child's world. But it's also important that we look at the daily lives and, and our adults' work, because the physical activity and the participation is constructed with the child and adults' collaboration in daily life contexts. So I think we have to stop how do we do it together. And in my, my research, we found a key elements how we should construct the collaboration and there are child-oriented factors that we should look at, focus on how we encourage, how we listen, how we listen our child children, how we support decision-making and goal setting, how we make agreements together, agreements with the child and with, with adults, and of course, with among adults also. What kind of atmosphere we have in our collaboration, how open and active our collaboration is, and how we design individual practices, how we support the friendships. And this is all about focusing, not just today, but looking forward. So in our collaboration, we should have also the future orientation with us because our children will grow up one day and they also want to participate in the adulthood. So we can together prepare them for the active and participative adulthood. So as you can see, there are many similar elements in F -word, ICF F words with the Sarah Friedman work and of course in, in my research also. But then if you look at that, we need also the tools for enhancing child's participation and active agency and to our collaboration. In Finland, in, in Metropolia University of Applied Sciences has developed this CMAP book. And it's a tool to enhance, enhance child's participation and active agency. And it's also a tool for collaborative rehabilitation planning. It's a book full of pages describing and made by children. What are the meaningful activities and things for them? What kind of daily routines they have? What kind of needs they have? So it's a book that grows up with the child. You can put and add more information whenever you want to the book. And the book can be an application like an ebook or if you want the traditional version, so you can make a paper version about it. So it's all about the children's meaningful activities and what they want to learn and, and, in, and what they need from us adults. So here is one example from one CMAP book. It's a boy's book and it's a, this page is a description description of what he knows and what he can do. It's made by a book creator application. I don't know if you know it. It's a free application. It's easy to use and you can share it with other people, for other adults, for a teacher, for rehabilitation, for professionals. So this is an example of one page of the book. And the boy has wanted to tell us that he is a fast runner, great dancer, dances like a disco king. He enjoys comics, especially superheroes and Hulk. He loves to play role games and steal my sister's important stuff. And he tells us I'd, run, I'd rather run and for, walk free than forced to sit in a wheelchair. That is his wish. And he loves to ride his horse, Mickey, because riding helps to improve his balance and patience. 
So this is a book, as you can see, one page, including texts, pictures, audio files, videos, whatever the child wants to add in the book. And he can remove, remove stuff if he wants or add anything. And you can put so many pages that you want to. It's a, it's a free choice. So how this uh, book can be used. You can use it for preparation phase when the child and family prepares themselves before meeting with the professionals. Uh, it also shows the child's perspectives and the child's participation in rehabilitation planning comes more involved. Like I told you, it could be a collaboration tool to have shared understanding how to support child's meaningful activities and participation in everyday life. And of course, it's a collaborative tool you can use in rehabilitation planning, goal setting, assessment, action planning, and so on. So this book can be used many ways. And what we have learned using this book, the benefits of the book was that it deepened the shared understanding of the daily lives and the families and the child's daily lives. Uh, users, the professionals and children and families thought that it was exciting, it motivated, and it gave commitment. It also, it is an ident identification of strengths and issues that need practicing. Also, at the same time, protecting and enhancing the positive identity of the child. And it made the rehabilitation more concrete and attached to the daily life. It also built collaboration in child's network in daily life. Uh, the families and the children needed some support from the professionals. Sometimes professionals did the book together with the child and the family, and they gave instructions how to make the book. And sometimes they encouraged the child and the family to make the book. The challenging things were that it takes time a little bit, and sometimes they worried how to keep the book up, updated, Sometimes the child and the family were not motivated to making the book. So the professionals thought that they had to motivate more them to do the book. Of course, it was not necessary if they didn't want. And sometimes if you use the book creator, there were some technical challenges. But it also changed professionals work. It was a new tool to make more child and family center therapy practice. It secured the child's best interest in rehabilitation. It gave more courage to collaborate and build networks that support the achievement of the child's rehabilitation goals. It changed attitudes, and sometimes it even replaced the old way of informing the family about the therapy because they could use the CMAP book. So this was a very good tool to enhance the child's participation and active agency and also giving us a new tool to collab make more collaboration in, in pediatric rehabilitation. So at the end of my presentation, I want to give you some take-home messages, just noting that physical activity is not just being fit, it is also look at, looked at the wider perspective as a health behavior or, or is, it is also a, being a part of community and the daily settings in life situations. Description of the child's meaningful things helps to develop child-oriented rehabilitation and it also involves the child to it. Participation is constructed in child's and adult's collaboration and using participation-focused interventions, we create conditions or situation for the child's growth towards particip participative adulthood. So I think that this was my presentation. Thank you for your attention. And you can see my uh, contact information in the slides if you want to ask or learn more. But I think I'll pass, pass it on to Maggie now.
Thank you all for listening and your attention. So Maggie, are you ready? Thank you, Anu. Well, as ready as I'll ever be. Yes, I am ready. <laughs> um, <laughs> let me uh, get my slides up. And I suppose I should, uh, hang on a second, open up my video so everybody can see me. Not that, not that that's necessary. Well, maybe I won't because I can't find me at the moment. Let me stop sharing and open up. Hmm, that's funny. There we go. There we go. Takes a village. Um, hello, everybody. I'm going to say good morning because it's morning for me in Massachusetts. Um, and I'm Maggie O'Neill. And thanks, Dale, for the introduction. It was wonderful. And thanks, Anu, for your setting me up. That's awesome as well. So I'm taking a slightly different tact here as I talk, uh, take the big picture that Anu presented to us and talk specifically to the children who participate with their parents and their healthcare providers in this larger contextual participation environment. So um, I'm going to speak more to things specific to the child and activity based interventions, um, if that's okay. Uh, and I hope it is because that's what I got ready. Um, so the first thing, if I can advance my slides, is my objectives from the grand tour of objectives for our presentation is to talk about clinical decision-making strategies specific to the children's needs in becoming more active to be able to participate in the community um, settings and activities of their choice that um, are designed well for them and certainly welcome in, in listening to Anu and what's happening in Finland. So that's terrific. And also to, to identify from my, uh, my charge, some active ingredients and activity-based interventions to promote the child and family participation. So it's clinical reasoning and clinical decision-making. My uh, pyramid here is a little bit busy, so I apologize for that. But simply put, um, we are evidence-based practitioners or evidence-informed practitioners. So the outer blue area, royal blue area, uh, tells us that in that role, our clinical judgment, our skills and expertise, combined and quite frankly led by the family and patients' needs, goals, preferences, and values, uh, will guide what we do, but the evidence in our area, in our wheelhouse, will inform us. In the US, the American Physical Therapy Association um, tells us, uh, the membership and the therapists here, that we must be pr providing our interventions using the elements of patient care. That's this gray circle here. So our expertise, our families and children, and our evidence guide us to work in this examination, evaluation, developing um, using your clinical judgment to develop your plan of care interventions and your outcome assessment. That's a cyclical um, experience and process that pediatric physical, well, physical therapies period, but my world's everything peds, um, will, will use to conduct their practice for their practice patterns. And all of it is centered on the ICF model. And this is not F word, so shame on me, but it is body function and structure, the fitness component of the personal dimensions of the ICF, activity or the function, fitness, function, and friends, the participation. And right smack dab in the center is, this has to be, I call it my North Star. I say that to students all the time, find your North Star and follow it, stick with it, your ever fixed mark. And my ever fixed mark is making sure that the children and the families have the contextual factors, the family and environments that's going to best support their goals and needs. To me, the best day in physical therapy is the day they don't need me anymore. That's the best day. Um, so this is, I, I invite people to consider these elements in clinical decision-making, the evidence-based practice model. It's APTA elements of patient care, but 
you know, quite frankly, I love the APTA, but you know, we didn't invent the we didn't invent the wheel, literally the wheel here, and then the ICF model, so that we in, that we incorporate what we need from these three bases, if you will, in our clinical decision making. But when you get right down to it in pediatrics, the decisions we make in our intervention strategies, whether they're one on one in a clinic setting or hopefully moving them to the community settings, that there's more access and availability, get right down to what does the research evidence tell us. What can we do and what are our skill sets? Because if it's something that we think the family needs and they say they need it, their preferences, and it's not in our wheelhouse of skills, send it off to one of our colleagues who does that kind of work. That's no harm in that, that's a good thing. And then what are the community, home and community resources? So what we can do, what we know we should be doing, what the child and family tell us they would like us to do for their goals and preferences, and what the resources home and community afford to be able to get to that decision, get to that outcome for that child and family. Of course, the considerations along that way in clinical decision-making are what is the job of an infant and toddler? And then a preschooler, taking the, looking at the child in their age and stage when they come to you as you know, your client, your patient, the family you're working with, whatever terminology works for you. What I love about this, um, my references are at the end. What I love about this CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, is that um, so it, there's similarities as you grow and develop across your ages, but babies, yeah, they want to move, they want to do transitions, they want to play and explore. Preschoolers, now that, oh, now maybe they want to play with you, they want more social interaction, so finding that environment for the interaction. Um, school age children want more social interaction, not just with, and more in opportunities with sports and play in with their peers. And I like working very much. I like working with high schoolers because they want nothing to do with me. And there's the challenge with how to help them be independent and support them in a way that is not supporting them as to, because they want to be independent, if that makes any sense. So um, wh where are the children or the teens in their ages and um, stages what they need and want from us? So um, of course, as physical therapists, we all write SMART goals. Some of us write them better than others, and I'm in the category of always needing to improve. But basically, the focus and where we're going with the interventions or the collaborations are really what goal-driven by the family and child. Is it truly you're telling me you can't get to the bus on time in school? That was my problem growing up, but it's just because I wasn't paying attention. If it's you're, you can't get to the bus, well, do we need to work on walking speed? That's not really glamorous, but if that's what you need to get to the bus, let's do that. You, you know, you want to go to that community center, but it's you got to get you got to climb some stairs to get there. Okay, let's work on that. So, bottom line, here are some examples of goals. What are the goals that we need to turn into smart goals to help that child, adolescent, youth? Um, engage in their community environment most successfully for their goals. I invite everybody to take a look at, if you want, an examination process to be able to tease out those pieces that go into the soup of our active ingredients. The American Physical Therapy Association, as well as the Academy of Pediatrics, that's us, um, Dale and I are members of that within the APTA, uh, put out this call this, uh, for people to please take a look at this template. There's the um, website for it, um, for examination. We as the APTA and the Academy of Pediatrics are, um, I guess, launching a campaign to see if we can do annual evaluations or examinations on children with all kinds of conditions and at risk for conditions to help them be more healthy and ready to participate in those activities as they present themselves. So what I like about this template, what I don't like about it is it's long, but what I like about it is I like to look at it to see what I may or may have um, forgotten or you know missed, missed in my exam. And I like that it's bringing more the physical activity and your health into it, in addition to what we quote unquote traditionally do to look at movement patterns and synergies, et cetera. So I, it's really working hard in my opinion to um, marry the public health activities in children to what we look at in rehab, child and pediatric rehabilitation. So it's there and if it's a useful tool, that's wonderful. So what about intervention approaches? Well, my favorite definition of physical fitness is the one here in red. It's not mine. It came from uh, the reference there, Melina. It is the state or condition that permits the individual to carry out the daily activities without undue fatigue 
and sufficient reserve to enjoy active leisure? How can we help a kiddo who has to, who goes to school because they gotta, but wants to play little league after school because they wanna? So how can we help them get to in a conditioned state um, that allows them to do what they got to do. So when they go home, they can do what they want to do. And um, that may include some physical activity interventions. It may include some exercise interventions, but um, how can we help the child in that aspect? I look to our colleagues in health psychology. I know I saw Dr. York on the on the panel here, and this is from Jim Rimmer, who is uh, works in Alabama with Dr. York. I really enjoyed Dr. Rimmer's work. If you haven't read him, I would invite you to read some of his work. As a health psychologist, he's looking for ways to enhance uh, physical activity and fitness with people with disabilities in the community. And here we have on the x-axis weeks and months and the y-axis health and function. And he's just, I think this is an elegant way of saying, we know in rehab, whether it's inpatient, he's talking to inpatient, but quite frankly, I think inpatient or outpatient. We know in rehab with higher dosing of interventions, we get, we help our patients become more healthy and have better function or improved function. With shorter lengths of stay in the hospital, we see that coming down quickly once they're discharged. Longer lengths of stay, we might help the patient get to a plateau. Yet when they leave us, whether it's in or out patient, we see a decrease in the activity levels that may impact negatively their health and function. And how can we help enhance or increase this threshold for risk on health and function? How can we help um, keep this plateau from diminishing? And I think that's to me, one of our uh, hardest for me, a hard and one of my biggest goals. So in that vein, a call to action to me is some work from our colleagues from the Netherlands, Menon's people in the, in the Netherlands, that this is, this is to me is an incredible, another, I like these figures and charts. On the x-axis is sedentary behavior, light physical activity, moderate physical activity. On the y-axis is an estimate of percentage of time spent in sedentary, light, moderate to vigorous activity. The, the um, different bar charts of different colors, GMFCS levels one through five. So basically what I have circled here from this article by Vershuren et al on exercise and activity recommendations for people with cerebral palsy. So this is cerebral, obviously GMFCS levels, cere cerebral palsy specific, but it's saying to me, hey Maggie, even the kids who are most functional GMFCS level one, all the way up through level five are not getting, are spending more than 75% of their time on average in sedentary behavior. Call to action. How do we help? What do we do? Um, another uh, from the um, Vashurin's group, Vashurin et al. from 2014, is I think a possible solution and an active ingredient is what I call physical activity diet. Wrong word, sorry, but I'm stealing terminology from our OT friends who talk about sensory diets for kids with sensory integration challenges. So what about can we, after we work with our children, say, okay, on the here I circled the first column. On the row is what is the child's daily routine like? I wake up, I go to school, I go to, I'm, I, I take a trip to school, I'm in school, I take a trip home after school, I go to bed. It doesn't sound very fun, but in the course of those blocks of time, what are you doing? And is it sedentary, light, or moderate physical activity or intense physical activity levels in that in those activities? And how can we promote more of uh, variety in it and more higher intensity for health and function outcomes to be able to participate in those great community activities that they want to participate in. So that brings us to what do we want to do in activity based interventions to me it's looking at, of course, we know this the child the task and the environment. And in the work I've done with kids, primarily with cerebral palsy, it's been more clinic or uh, actually university and clinic based than it has been community based. So that's my disclaimer, but we've done activity trial interventions to see if the children, what is the physical activity intensity need to do some of these activities that are like activities of daily living. And then some custom game development um, 
active video game and immersive virtual reality as a tool to help kids become more active and have fun. So in our activity trial studies, uh, we're looking at this, the wheel of sedentary, what you might do as a school chore, household chore, active leisure chore, and um, transportation physical activity, walking and stair climbing. And here's a list of some of the activities. So there were activity stations in a large clinic room. That's not real world in real life. That's not in the wild. Absolutely not. Big limitation. But trying to find out these are somewhat activities of daily living not contextualize in your environment, as I said, given, but how much, how hard is it for a kiddo to do these things with cerebral palsy? So we've had um, in one of our projects, 57 kids, average age of 12, across the activities, no kidding, the active leisure was the Xbox Connect. They liked that's the best. That's what brought us to looking at active video games. And um, one thing I didn't mention when I went to the activity intervention slide, activity and measure. How are we going to measure these activities qualitatively, quantitatively mixed? What we did was look at three different activity monitors on the child, as well as the oxygen consumption for intensity. Here I am showing this kiddo in elementary school, I think he's nine, how to use this rate of perceived exertion before he gets started on his physical activity trials because we did the rate of perceived exertion, heart rate, oxygen consumption, and activity levels at each of the stations to see which ones were um, more demanding of them. And, and the, I had this in red because the kids liked the Xbox the best. But to a news point that sometimes we as adults and parents don't know what kids can do, one of our activities was household. So either folding laundry and carrying it or cleaning the kitchen table. And one mother said, I didn't know you could do that. And I'm like, oh, you just got a charlist kid. You're going to have to do some work at home now. But I mean, that's not a bad thing. Um, so anyway, we looked at what these kids' activity levels were. Here's this little boy, same boy, playing the River Rush game. We chose this game because it's a lower extremity game, and there's some jumping, and you're on a raft, and you're trying to balance and jump and get the, um, and I think I had more involvement than him, and you're trying to jump and get the uh the prizes to get points. And here's one that's upper extremity called Space Pops, a commercial game. He didn't get it at first. And I'm trying to tell him that you have to flap your arms to go up in space and fly like it. There he goes to fly like a spaceman and get, get your points by hitting the space pops, popping the space balloons. So again, activity for lower and upper extremities that led us to working with computer engineers on creating games. I meant to shut that off, sorry. Of the volume off creating games for the kids to work on standing games and sitting games for upper and lower extremity um, range of activity as well as balancing to see how the kids and these kids are wearing these are teenagers obviously and they are wearing activity monitors as well as heart rate monitors to look at how much they're working um, again there's more pictures of different ideas on the games they could choose I want to play the dungeon game I want to play the wild west game um, in the activities and just quickly to say um, in one of our trials uh, we did with the custom games and other trials it was with the commercial games before we had the custom games. So this graph is telling us on the X axis, the type of games, supine, obstacle course, com comfortable walking, brisk walking. This is a writing task, sitting and writing like in school, a cleaning task, cleaning the table at home, an active video game as an active leisure task. And um, this is a stair task, climbing stairs. So across the board, looking at heart rate in the blue bar, how much their heart rate went up or not. And then the red is how many step counts in the activity. And it's counterintuitive. You would think obstacle course would have a lot of steps, but in the obstacle course, they, they would weave through cones. They would play some games at a game station an arts and game station, and they would walk a, um, a to 25 meter distance. So there was a lot, there was stop and go an obstacle course, which you would expect in life stopping and going. So just, we got some ideas and some of that did confirm and some didn't confirm what we thought these activities would cost in heart rate, step count, oxygen consumption in METs. On the right, the Y column on the right are the METs in O2, the Y column, the Y axis on the left is heart rate and step counts. It's a little bit busy, but you can see the trends in our activity protocols. So that led us to that, then say, well, the newest technology is immersive VR games. 
just quickly, we had just finished it with, and DPT students help with this, which I love, love, love getting them involved in cr critically looking at the evidence and in participating and contributing to it. So right now we're just finishing up a sitting game where the, it's a meadow world and a beach world and they're playing um, different games with their hands and feet and a standing game where it's crystal world and fire world. So they're in different worlds, grabbing things, kicking things, throwing things at targets across these four worlds. Um, and this is just one of our DPT students playing the game. Obviously, they're watching the game in the um, in the head-worn display, but when the parents are there for the kids, here's some pictures of the kids. GMFCS level three, he didn't want to use his walker, needs more assist. A young 12-year-old girl, GMFCS level three with her gait trainer, GMFCS level two, sitting lovely posture there playing that one of the sitting games. When the parents are there, they do questionnaires pre and post, the parents can watch on the big screen what their children are seeing in the um, head-worn display so that everyone knows what everyone's doing. And that's the purpose of it. So the parents can also give us questionnaire feedback on how they thought this was for their kids as well the kids doing the same. Um, so that's that's my spiel. That's my uh, overview of what we're doing. Ideally, we're going to we would like to keep moving on these games. Had a meeting with one of the game designers yesterday. Looks like they're working on the technology to have a social game so that more than one kiddo can play at a time. And when I and my goal is to get these out into the community schools and or rec centers because just because a a having a a community center or a community activity for kids is great. B, is the activity itself accessible to the kids? So can we get more ch choices in what's happening in the community? And maybe this will be a reasonable choice. So take home message, we are agents of change for families and kids. If we can work, we do, do, we do this, continue to identify the family routines and their activities and their preferences, designing these interventions to increase fitness and activity. And when they're ready to change, I've had kids tell me, you know what, Miss Maggie, I don't like this game. I want to stop. I want a different game. That's great. Keep telling me what you need and want, and we'll try to figure it out, providing the recommendations, consulting. I'm going to have them, I'm going to consult so that they can go to figure out how to get them to Finland, to our news programs. Um, and at the end of the day, find the community resources or develop the new community programs with, whether it's with technology or old fashioned way with adaptive sports, whatever is what the, meets the child and family needs. And thank you very much. And here's my references, and you can certainly get in touch with me. That's my email at University of Massachusetts. And I will stop sharing and yield to Manan, I believe. Uh, yes, uh, wait, I'm going to share, let me see, the screen first, yes. Yes, can everybody see the screen? I don't hear anything, but I think it will do. It will go yes, okay. It okay. looks great, Madame. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Maggie, for the interesting information that you shared with us. Greetings from a sunny Utrecht, the Netherlands. Uh, so, my name is Manon, and I will now continue with objective number three. We're going to talk. Uh, to you about identifying active ingredients in activity-based interventions to promote child and family participation. Uh, and I would like to point out that we are really focusing, focusing on participation in physical activities. And we believe that participation in physical activities uh, is participation in all activities of daily living. So this is activities such as playing sports, but also active outside play or active transfer to, for example, school. At the end, I'll share two examples from the Netherlands, how we try to support child and their families to participate in daily physical activity. And let me see, my computer is a bit slow. Oh, it doesn't work. Wait. Okay, I will stop sharing and share again because it doesn't work. Okay, I'm sorry. I have to see if I can do something about that. Mm, let's see. Okay, 
again. Try again. Yeah, and that works. Okay, I'll try again to share the screen. Okay, share. No, it doesn't work. It stops working when I share the screen. Mm, I'm going to see if I can share this screen. Just a moment. I have no idea why this doesn't work. Normally, we're not allowed to use Zoom, so maybe that's a problem. I'm going to see if I can do it like this. Share screen. So, then I can, no, it also doesn't work. Oh. Yeah, it works like this. Okay, this is a bit awkward. Yeah, I'm going to try again. It works. Yeah, now it works. Okay, so um, we know from literature that we can train children with disabilities. So if we want to train fitness, we can make sure that the fitness increases. For example, aerobic capacity or anaerobic capacity or agility. Uh, however, we also know that most of the time when the training stops, the effects of the training also disappear and fitness will decrease again. And the question that we have is, does really uh, uh, lead physical fitness training, does it really lead to an increase of physical activity? So we performed a, a systematic review a couple of years ago, and uh, then we learned that physical training alone did not uh, lead to an increase of physical activity levels. And I have to point out that the review was from 2017, so that's already quite some time ago, and that also the re uh, uh, results were only limited to children with cerebral palsy. But um, we do know that there is a wide variety of barriers and facilitators related to participation in physical activity for children with physical disabilities. They're both situated in the environmental factors and in the personal factors of the ICF. And the challenges, challenges lies in analyzing which barriers and facilitators are relevant for the specific child, their family, and the context. And we have to see to develop the right interventions that interact with the specific barriers and facilitators that are there. During our research project, and we call it what moves you, we used the co-design approach to develop new interventions together with stakeholders, such as PPTs, parents, and children. Co designers and researchers. We use co-creation sessions and design sessions to create prototypes. Which we tested in our living labs with pediatric parents. And the starting point of this research project was the information that was already available from literature about the personal and environmental factors regarding participation in physical activity for children with physical disability and their parents. So we described the knowledge during this project in a manuscript. But we also displayed the information into knowledge cards, as you can see here. And these knowledge cards can be used by pediatric physical therapists or by other stakeholders to learn more about the important themes and sub-themes regarding participation in physical activity in children with disability and their parents. And now I will tell you a bit more about the themes that we identified from both the literature and uh, our research project. So the main themes that we identified were stimulating self-efficacy, stimulating autonomy, focusing on possibilities, focusing on the needs of the individual child, collaborating with stakeholders, connect, connecting with a child's environment, and also meaningful goal setting. I will, in the following slides, I will talk more about the main themes and including sub-themes. So for stimulating self-efficacy, fostering confidence, fostering feeling secure, having insight in their own possibilities and being motivated were pointed out as positive sub-themes. Positive experiences for feeling confidence were described when children were able to move without uh, assistance. For example, when self-propelling their wheelchair instead of being pushed all the time. 
In a movie that I will play now, uh, you can see a nice example of a girl using a frame runner. A frame runner is kind of a bike uh, with uh, three wheels and it doesn't have pedals. So the child can walk using the frame runner. And this is a, a mobility aid which is uh, used by uh, children with uh, severe physical disabilities. And the girl is now able to move around in a fast way. And she experiences speed that is created by herself. So you do not understand the language of this movie because it is in Dutch, but I would still like to show it to you because at the end of the movie, you hear the laughter and you can see the fun that she has during the frame run. I also would like you to watch what happens when her mother tries to slow her down. The girl says, nee, dat wil ik niet. This means in English, no, I don't want that. And she wants her mother to let go and to run. This also shows that it is difficult for parents sometimes to let go of their child with a physical disability. And that also parents need to feel confident and secure and that they have insight in the possibilities of their child. A participant of our project said that we create feelings of insecurity and a delay in motor development if we can't achieve that children know what their own competence are. So now I will try to show you the movie. Stimulating autonomy. The importance of stimulating autonomy for children with a physical disability was mentioned often. Participants believe that in order to become autonomous, it is important for children to be able to deny help, know their own boundaries, and know who is responsible. Parents and healthcare providers are often overprotective and oversupportive, and they often provide help immediately, as mentioned by a parent. I find it hard to give my child the opportunity to deny help and become independent. A participant expressed that it is important for children to explore their boundaries. By doing and discovering a child will experience their boundaries. So dare to search for their real boundaries. A solution-oriented approach where children are able to create their own solutions seem a positive factor for being autonomous. Often healthcare providers take control. For example, bus drivers, they often push children in a wheelchair from to school and uh, to the school bus. And even if these children are able to self-propel a wheelchair. And I have to be honest, if I ask this to pediatric physical therapists, a lot of PPTs also push children in a wheelchair, even though they are uh, really easy, are able to do it themselves. And you have to ask, what are the consequences of this behavior to a child's psyche? It is important to be able to try out new activities and to learn by trial and error. We should provide children and their parents this opportunity. So focusing on abilities instead of focusing on obstacles is essential when stimulating a physically active lifestyle. Ask what a child can do or what they cannot do. The way to achieve this is to create solutions in a child's own environment that are creative, fun, but also challenging. The importance of small steps toward the final goal was highlighted in order to celebrate actual successes. And then focusing on the needs of the individual child. When a healthcare professional is focused on facilitating a physically active lifestyle, it is important to focus on the needs of the individual child and their parents. The provided care must therefore have a tailored approach and the solutions for increasing physical activities must be suitable for a child and their environment. A participant said, it involves customization. 
while protocols do not take the real needs of a child into account. We have to give the child a central position, as we often talk about children when we really have to talk with children. And I really think this really connects with the info that, uh, with the info that Anu presented us in the beginning with the case example. It is also important to listen. Parents from children with disabilities, they expressed. I wish professionals would really listen to parents in an open conversation without prejudice caused by the diagnosis. And they also said, it feels like fighting when I'm not heard. So collaborating with stakeholders. Collaboration between pediatric physical therapists in different settings, such as rehabilitation centers, special schools and private practices is essential. So children receive the right care nearby their home. And furthermore, collaboration with other professionals, such as teachers or PE teachers, care sports connectors and social workers that facilitates finding sports possibilities and other possibilities to become and stay physically active. And proper collaboration means equality between different stakeholders and also sharing knowledge. We heard from, for example, teachers, PE teachers, but also from care sports connectors that they really needed the knowledge that PPTs have about children with disabilities and uh, opportunities to become physically active. Then connecting with a child's environment. Connecting with a child's environment was often mentioned when discussing to facilitate children's physical activity in their own life settings and have activities play, take place in a meaningful environment, including the social environment. And that's another key ingredient when facilitating a physically active lifestyle. Involving parents is, just, is not just letting parents watch, but let them participate and experience Friends of a child sometimes come to my treatment so that these children can learn skills together and integrate this activity. If a child wants to connect with their environment, it is important that a child is visible. So that, for example, other children in their own environment know who they are. This was explained by an adult with a physical disability himself. It is important to make yourself visible to other children in your own environment. The older you get, the more difficult this is. So he emphasized on the fact that it is important to start very early. Then meaningful goal setting. Goal setting was often mentioned as one of the most important aspects of a healthcare intervention. For children, parents, and their healthcare prov uh, providers, it is important that goals are relevant and purposeful and that the main goals of therapy is focused on facilitating participation. So if we look at this information, then we have to ask ourselves, what can we do this, with this information as pediatric physical therapists? And what does this mean for our role and how we work? And we believe that our results are in line with the work, for example, of Reedman et al., but also with the work that Anu was sharing and Maggie was sharing earlier. Um, we should embed phys uh, behavioral change in pediatric physical therapy research, education, and practice. We also believe that we should provide pediatric physical therapy in a meaningful context of the child and his or her parents. And furthermore, we also believe that we should not only focus on sports, but also on other physical activities, such as active outside play. And now I will present my two examples that we use in the Netherlands to facilitate participation in physical activity in children with disability and their parents. And one of the ways is by uh, providing wheelchair skills training. And in this wheelchair skills training, children who use a wheelchair le learn important wheelchair skills. And first they start inside, but after they also go outside and learn these skills in a meaningful context. And also not only children, but also parents are included because also the parents have to learn and understand all the possibilities uh, that you have when you are riding a wheelchair. 
Furthermore, the training not only focuses on skills, it also focuses on self-confidence of children and also on self-confidence of the parents. Children learn their own possibilities and boundaries. The children and their parents learn to let go. A parent said, wheelchair training, that is very important, I think, that they really learn to go up and down the stairs. A lot of places are not adjusted for wheelchairs. And she can do much more now. And you can just go. Your life becomes a lot more fun. I will show you the movie. Um, and it is subtitled in English. So you can read uh, with it. So I hope you all uh, could see the movie and could read the text uh, together with it. Uh, but just uh, as a small summarize, you can really see that the children not only learned the skills, but they also got more confidence and also the parents got more confidence. And the interesting part, I think, uh, that I would like to point out um, that during these trainings, which they really perform into a real life context, so sometimes other people, um, they come down to the children and that then, then they say that they have to be careful. And maybe it's better for not uh, them not to take the stairs, but take the elevator, et cetera. So this points out, still points out, I think, um, how the uh, society or the social context is looking uh, two children with a physical disability and uh, the possibilities that they have. And I think that these children are uh, uh, being able to do much more uh, than most of the time people think. So then we have the second example, and this is called the What Moves You Toolkit. Uh, and this is a toolkit that we developed. Uh, and the uh, goal of the toolkit is to incorporate behavioral change into pediatric physical therapy practice. Um, we developed a prototype of the toolkit and uh, by the experiences that we had during the feasibility study, we uh, reanalyzed all the results and uh, made uh, adjustments and now we have the real toolkit which is really available in pediatric physical therapy practice at the moment. So uh, what is this toolkit? The toolkit exists of 10 uh, practical tools that uh, pediatric physical therapists can easily use during clinical practice. And the tools facilitate the integration of behavioral change techniques into PPT practice. And they are originated from the main themes and subthemes that arose during the What Moves You project. And examples that we uh, developed are stickers and cards that facilitate denying help by children, conversation tools that facilitate incorporating meaningful environments in PPT treatment, and also tools that facilitate solution oriented thinking of children and their parents. And what we learned from the pediatric physical therapist is that 
practical tools like this uh, make it much easier for them to uh, um, use uh, behavioral change techniques and also easier for them to, for example, talk to parents or children uh, uh, um, about, uh, for example, difficult topics about why uh, they don't choose to do a certain activity or uh, maybe why they feel uh, they're uh, scared or other uh, things that are uh, important. So we implemented the first toolkits uh, in uh, pediatric physical therapists uh, working with the FitKit Foundation. The FitKids Foundation is a foundation in the Netherlands that stimulates physical fitness and physical activity uh, with a disability. And we did that by developing uh, um, a blended education consisting of web lectures, uh, but also face-to-face -face mo uh, moments and digital meetings. And by doing so, we hope to support the DPTs uh, to really integrate behavioral change techniques into their clinical practice. Because what we do know that it, in the Netherlands, DPTs find it quite difficult to integrate uh, the uh, behavioral change techniques into their practice uh, because they're not always used to, uh, for example, um, uh, use coaching or, uh, or other techniques. So then I would like to end uh, with a quote that I heard uh, from a mother with a physical disability. Uh, and uh, she said, uh, there are no limitations. You only have to facilitate the opportunities. So I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. And I will pass it on to Dale right now. Thank you very much, Manon. Uh, I just want to give you all a brief example, two brief examples of what I've used in the community because I've worked with parents for such a long time, more than 40 years now. And one of the things I always see is that parents have dreamed, and any of you that are parents have dreamed about your child's capacity and abilities and what they might be um, when they grow older. And one of the things that seems to be most devastating to them is. Uh, when they learn of their child's um, um, diagnosis, that they feel that they have, uh, un they have to think all again about what this child will be like. And so um, that has been an important part of my life to look at how we could, as physios, find ways to share and to really accommodate. My colleagues have done an amazing job talking to you about what they've done in the research domain So, um, and, and in their communities. So what I wanted to do is just share with you two examples of how I've collaborated and used an inclusive family-based intervention to promote physical activities with children um, and participation for um, their children and their families. So we're really looking to optimize this fitness in the schools, the home and the community. And my activities will be focused primarily in the community. Um, you might know a young boy or a young girl that's talked about wanting to be a ballerina. And if you have um, some physical impairments, there's always that sadness of their parents and the child that they're not able to dance in a community. Um, my daughter was a dancer and one of the things we thought they could do is to embrace this community. And so three young women started a project where they um, brought children together with physical impairments, uh, cognitive, auditory and visual impairments into a dance program that they uh, promoted on a weekly basis. Um, and they had different groups of children by age and population. And their parents were so uh, thrilled at this other opportunity they would have to just be with peers in a non-school-based environment because they haven't found these community activities for their young girls or boys to participate. And as the children progressed, we could see them doing it without as much physical support um, in the communities. And this young little girl here I, uh, will um, uh, really look at what she's done when she wanted to continue in this program. So this program lasted for eight weeks. These young dancers um, would give children the opportunity to participate as their ability produced. And these are my, the three triplets. Um, that we have in the, um, that were in the program. 
um, definitely embracing this and their moms, uh, were, mom and dad were very happy in their ability to focus their energies. At the end of the session, each child receives this certificate, which seemed to be such a positive experience for them. And they were offered the opportunity to participate in the Mohawk Valley Performing Arts production. And here we have um, one of the little girls in the production. These are two of their instructors right here. So there they're able to uh, view how they are an active part of a community activity and successful watching um, individuals spend their role on. In fact, that young girl was um, so thrilled with this that she, um, as she got older, continued to perform in the ballet. So here she is again. This was an extremely successful program. It was motivating for the children. It provided the self-efficacy for them. They increased their um, involvement with their peers. Um, and it really did promote how they could be an active part of their community. The second example I want to give you is a young boy who was four years old. And he was receiving physical therapy by another person another therapist, but was really difficult to engage, very reluctant to participate. Um, and in, in an effort to engage him more, well, when I took him on, um, I asked him what it was that he would enjoy doing. And he said his brother was, a big brother was a big soccer player and his dad practiced every night with him. And he really wanted to learn how to uh, play soccer. He wanted to be on a team. He had tried last year but had really been reluctant because he felt like he didn't have the skills. So we worked on endurance and on speed and on eye hand and eye foot coordinated coordination. He was so driven to do this with his um, practicing at home that his dad and his brother made this a daily family activity. We did see all of his skills improving, his um, ability to navigate stairs, um, his engagement with his peers in um, his playground setting in his preschool. And by the end of the year, he had made great gains. And his mom messaged me at the end of the year and let me know that he had made a soccer team and that he was figuring out how to navigate this. When in the beginning, he had stood back in the first year, he wasn't participating. He was looking on and trying to discern where he might participate in the soccer activities and could see what his brother was doing. He just felt like an outsider watching. But by the end of the session, what we, his mom could tell me was what we could see is he knew that he was positively engaging, that he was a winner and that he was um, definitely someone who could play soccer and we had used this as the motivating force behind what he wanted to do. That high level physical activity that um, Maggie talked about, uh, the um, community engagement that we heard about from a new and from a known. You can see the positive experiences that children have and I know all of you have these experiences but when you look at all of this together, this is what we see and this is what we're looking for after all. So at this point, I'd like to offer um, about eight minutes um, for um, people to enter questions into the chat room. And um, I will monitor the chat room and see um, what we might have for questions. So the first question is, um, like to ask for suggestions for clinicians about where we can start to work with fat children and families to increase physical activity. So um, we've shown in different environments how we can do this. What is it? I think we've heard from our colleagues. What is it that the child wants to be able to do? Because that seems to be central to what is going to motivate this child and this family. What does the family enjoy doing? Is it downhill skiing? Is it walking or hiking? Um, what is it that we could find that the family would also be motivated to do? Do any of my colleagues have any additional comments or questions about that um, question that came into the chat, the first question? Um, <clears throat> hey, that's a great question and thanks Dale, it's Maggie. Um, I think that those are great suggestions and to the whoever asked the question, 
my first thing is doing an asset, you know, assessment and what are the family's assets and resources. I've done things as I believe simple and elegant as turn on the music and dance in the kitchen. If you don't have a car or can't get on the bus or you just can't get to a place, I can't afford downhill skiing in the US. I don't know what it's like in your country, but what is it that the child likes to do? And can you create that? The, the best physical activity for anybody to ask anybody to do is the one they like to do. Um, if a community pool, is that possible? So I think the first thing is what well, it's a mom and the child or the, I say mom, parents and child, um, what's their daily routine? What activities do they do? And how do we increase that? What activities do they aspire to do? And how do we create that? And it's no pun intended, it's small steps to move forward in that direction. And I think that may fade in, feed into the behavioral changes. Are they ready for change? If they're asking for that change, could be. And I know Manon has incorporated behavioral change um, theory and, and practice in her work. Um, and I think that that's critical to look at. So I don't know if that's helpful, but I, I start really small, walk around the block, walk around the neighborhood, and then, and hopefully build it to something like join a soccer team or go skiing. I would also like to add, thanks for Maggie and Dale for great suggestions, but I also want to remind you about the F words tools, because it's the one way to look at what Maggie was talking about, what they like, what is fun for the child and what is meaningful for the child to start more small, but you could use those tools to find it where to start. Okay, uh, we do have another question that came in and said, here are suggestions how to engage, motivate, or interact with parents who do not appear to be directly involved with their child's rehabilitation process, possibly during because of traumatic experiences in the healthcare system in the past. So do any of you of uh, my colleagues have suggestions about how that might happen? Yes. I will. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, talk uh, a little bit about that. What we heard from parents themselves, because we talked with parents uh, during our research project, what moves you, and uh, they told us that the most important thing that a PPT can do is just talk about these aspects. If you think that there is a problem there uh, that really is a barrier for parents to get engaged, uh, they really like you to uh, open the conversation because by asking them certain questions, um, then you open a conversation and then uh, uh, you can talk about it. If you do not talk about it, then it's more difficult for them to start about these kind of topics because they have to uh, start the conversation that. And uh, that is what parents told us. Just be open, ask questions, and then we can continue having a conversation about it. I think those are great points, Manon. And if I may, I would add to that. Um, in, in starting these conversations that are not always easy, um, I really emphasize I statements. I'm sensing that maybe this is uh, something you're not interested in doing or you're having trouble doing, or I'm sensing that this may be a challenge for you. Could you help me understand what it is? I mean, I had a 12 year old boy say to me, you're never gonna understand me, Miss Maggie. Fair enough, because you're old. That's right. And I need you to tell me what it is I need that you need me to do. So it's the I statement of I see this, I sense this, I'm wondering about this, and I'm asking you to help me understand what it is that you're thinking so I can help is how it's the motivational interviewing techniques, really, right, Manon? Yeah, I totally agree with you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Maggie and Manon, for those great responses. We have uh, one final question um, in the chat room um, regarding parents and children's um, concerns, uh, be able to be concerned about the necessity to think about orthopedic <coughs> issues later in the child's life. And I want to comment. Um, I want to make sure we respond to this issue, but it's. I think that probably most of what that is certainly an important aspect in many children's lives. Unfortunately, 
um, that's not part of the discussion for today. So I would uh, probably, um, if you think that's a, a suggestion for a future webinar, that would probably be, um, we'd have more time to talk about that and adequately address your question. So I apologize, but I really don't think that um, we're able in the time we have remaining um, or considering the topic that we presented to adequately address that. So um, I'll be happy to um, forward that on to the leadership of the IOPTP for a potential future webinar. And I, Maggie, do you wanna comment? No, I agree with everything you're saying, Dale. The, I'm not sure if the direction of the question was, is this, is this, but I, I know that conversations with parents and kids around orthopedic issues come up a lot with me as I'm working on dosing physical activity. And if it comes up, talk about it and refer to the orthopedic or whatever specialist needs to be part of that, it should be part of the conversation. So I always say, gosh, you know, maybe we're not gonna work on jumping because I'm, I see there's alignment concerns here. What do you think, mom? What do you think, kiddo? And then talk about going to the orthopedi orthopedist because that would be probably a good piece of uh, information to guide the whole process. Because the good news is there's no natural history of how, how much can we do with a kid before we cause pain because of malalignment orthopedically. Therefore, we don't know how much we can do. So it's, all, it's the team led by the parents, of course, and the child. Thank you very much, Maggie. Thank you all. Um, it's We've come to the end of our webinar today and I thank you all so very much for your patience and time. And we look forward to seeing you November 10th when we do our next webinar. So look forward to joining us. Have a wonderful day and be safe everyone.